What is up guys, it is the Sound Alchemist, and today I'm back to bring you some more gaming lore. I say gaming because today we're not talking about Warhammer 40k, today we are actually going through the four characters that I have created for the game that I have come to love, known as Dungeons and Dragons. That's right, if you guys didn't know, both Gershwin and I have recently been introduced to everything D&D, and we've had a few campaigns under our belts now, well, somewhat a few campaigns under our belt. We have one that we started, but we never finished, and we're currently in two campaigns right now. So, I decided to give you guys a little bit of an outlook and introduction into the characters that I have made for these campaigns. I will begin with the character that I've used the most, all the way up to a brand spanking new character that I recently made that I have yet to use, but I'm looking forward to using him in our games. So without further ado guys, let's dive into the lore of my four D&D characters. The first character that we start with is Alar Galanodare. He is a high elf of the moon elf um, tribe, I guess you can say, and he is a warlock. Um, going into his backstory, it dives into basically a tragedy. So here it is. The Galanodel family had sailed the seas as pirates for generations, and I, Alar, had been looking forward to captain my own vessel. For almost a century, I sailed alongside my brother, Eryx, and my father, Aegis, learning the ways of the ocean aboard our family ship, the Moon's Whisper. Just hours before the day that my father would step down and make me the captain, we discovered a burning shipwreck. My father quickly sailed over to provide aid, but upon stepping afoot on the ship, we soon discovered that everyone had been massacred. It wasn't until we stepped inside the captain's quarters that I saw him. Blanketed by shadows, he stood there, motionless, just staring at us. As soon as the sun set and darkness fell upon the cabin, he made his move. In an instant, he was already behind us, holding my father's severed arm. He drank the blood oozing from the appendage before discarding it. My father, Aegis, ordered my brother and I to flee while he tried to hold back this man. No, this monster off. We ran back in utter terror, but as soon as we stepped foot upon our own ship, the murderer stood there before us, clutching our father's head in his grasp. The Moon's Whisper's crew attacked, but their attempts at revenge was cut short, and they too shared their captain's fate. From the murderer's blind spot, an icy blast caught him off guard for just a split second, before he swept it aside. And by then, I had already plunged my sword deep into his heart. The killer laughed in my face, and he spoke. Looks like I may have some use for you, after all. And in a flash, the killer appears behind my brother, as he placed the same blade that had been piercing his heart just a second ago to my brother's throat. Join me, Alar Galanodare, and I will spare your brother's life. Holding back tears, I had no choice but to accept, and so began my life of servitude. As I saw my little brother sail away on the ship full of corpses, I, Alar Galanadel, the High Elf and new captain of the Moon's Whisper, vowed to kill this vampiric overlord of mine and avenge my father's death, as well as rejoin my little brother Eryx. It has now been six months since that fated day, and I've been fulfilling my servitude to Sargrom my father's killer and overlord, by bringing him powerful magical items, and also marking the location of powerful magic users. Now that I've made my pact with a demon, I'm one step closer to Sargrim's death, and also to my freedom. Yet, I can feel my heart sinking into darkness. So that's the tragic backstory of this high elf who at first had aspirations to sail the seas in freedom, 
basically explore the world alongside his brother, but the vampiric overlord of Sargrim had other plans. He's basically using Alar as a means to attain powerful items because Sargrim is also under the same pact that Alar is, following a demon of the Nine Hells. So Sargrim and Alar are kind of on the same page as to their they both want to gain power in order to kill their demonic ruler, but Alar has other things in mind. He needs to basically build a following because he knows that even if he is able to kill Sargrim, Sargrim is only one vampire in a coven of many, and he can't really fight back at this point because they're holding his brother hostage. So he's stuck between a rock and a hard place where the only way to attain power is to basically go deeper into darkness and become more of a servant to the demon. Um, how he's going to come out of this one, we're still in the middle of that campaign, so there hasn't been a solution as of yet. However, spoiler alert, this image is what Alar will become by the end of the campaign. So, spoiler alert, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really like his backstory. It's kind of tragic, but at the same time, it's a powerful motivation to do the things he does while playing D&D. Um, so, he's not quite a good guy, but he's doing it for a good purpose. If you see saving his brother as a good purpose, but if it means killing some innocents, yeah, that's where you gotta kind of weigh the scales on this one. So with that being said, let's dive into our next character, and that is Kyria Skyfallen. The Tiefling Ranger, Kyria Skyfallen. Amongst the edge of the woods in a small cabin, a newborn's cry rings out. Much to the dismay of the parents, their daughter appears quite different. Her hair is a silver white, while her skin is a light pink. The thing that really caught their eye, however, was that she had a tail. Her father now knew that these features were brought about by an ancestral curse. Long ago, the Sky Fallen family strived to summon forth a mighty demon from the Nine Hells to aid them during a war. Such help required a hefty price, and this price was never paid. As punishment, the demon massacred every other man in this family, and he laid with the widows, thus forever cursing the Skyfallens. Since then, every six generations, the firstborn child would possess demonic characteristics. This was known as the Infernal Heritage. For many years, Kyria was hidden from the townsfolk for fear of human ignorance towards tieflings. And unfortunately, Kyria's parents would soon be right. For one cold night, Kyria and her father went out into the woods to hunt, but they soon came across an injured man. This turned out to be a trap, as the so-called injured man's companions sought out to ambush the pair. Kyria's father tended to the wounds of this man, but by then, Kyria was using her dark vision, and she fired off a shot from her longbow into one of the bandits, causing them to brandish their knives. One bandit focused his attack on the young tiefling, but her father valiantly pushed him out of the way. Unfortunately, he ended up taking a knife to the gut in the process. Seeing her father get injured sent Kyria into a blind rage, as she fired volley after volley of arrows into the bandit, until her quiver ran empty. She then pounced on his already dead body, continuing her assault. The thieves froze in fear as their torches unveiled Kyria's demonic nature. Kyria's father took advantage of this opening and took Kyria and fled back into the cabin. Covered in blood, they entered the cabin. Kyria's mother rushed to their aid, fearing the worst. The father explained what had happened and urged them to flee knowing that soon the townsfolk would soon be at their door, pitchforks and torches at hand. Kyria could feel her father's emotions in his voice. She knew that she was to blame for this. She absolutely hated her horns, her tail, her appearance. 
She hated herself. Kyria's mother bandaged her father's wounds, but they both knew that this blow was indeed a mortal one. Still, they had no time to think about that, for they needed to pack their essentials and flee. Just then, the murderous chants of the town folks could be heard getting closer and closer. Kill the demon, burn the devil child. Kyria then sprang into action, grabbing her bow, while the flames of her anger built up within her. All of her enraged thoughts were silenced by the tender touch of her father, placing a calming hand upon her head. You're always so quick to anger, my little hothead. His warm smile burned into her memory as her anger dissipated. Daddy loves you. Remember this. And with these as his parting words, he went out to confront the mob, buying time for his family's escape. A hooded figure then stepped into view, smirking in all of his grandiose nature, as he persuaded the mob to engulf the cabin in flames. He then unsheathed his midnight blade, and plunged it deep into the heart of Kyria's father. Her mother rushed to her husband's aid. The mob then turned their attention towards her, and they began to pierce her body with the cold metal of their pitchforks. Kyria hid in dismay as her parents laid in a pool of their very own blood, whisking away as their happy home turned to ash. Tears streamed down Kyria's golden eyes, and she vowed to kill the hooded man and his band of thieves, and also to punish the townsfolk that burned down her home. Years passed, and now Kyria is 17 years old. She had been training, honing her tracking and hunting abilities with anger and revenge as her fuel. Donning her longbow and a pair of short swords, Kyria will be beginning her quest for vengeance. Once again with this character, we have revenge and tragedy as a huge motivator for her actions. Kyria is very quick to anger, and at this point, she pretty much hates herself. She blames herself for her family and her, her home and everything that happened. She thinks it's her fault. She absolutely hates her appearance as a tiefling, and she's trying her hardest to mask that. She also is doing this to blend in with the populace and to try to figure out where she can find this band of thieves and the mastermind behind it, the cloaked man. Um, unfortunately, this campaign, we've stopped playing it back in October, so the conclusion to this never really went everywhere. It's, it's open-ended. But basically what I was trying to go with this character is that she eventually learns that um, this bandit person there's really nothing really special about him. He's just a regular human who, for thousands of years, humans have never been keen to tieflings. They view them as, like you said, like I said here, devil children, like monsters, and because of that, she knows that humanity is just flawed. That's just the way of the world. And through her adventures, she basically begins to turn over a new leaf. To basically show that things happen and there's no way around it and she begins to appreciate her heritage more of being a tiefling and then eventually she begins to attain a power known as um, planar travel so then she begins to explore other planes and begins to react to different types of people and history and overall she's just trying to find herself and with planar travel being a thing she's exploring other worlds to see how she fits into these worlds and how they've been kind of dealt to the hand they've been given um, but again it, it never ended so I might continue it on myself I might continue the story I don't know but anyway, let's get into the other two characters that I've got. Oh, 